Hello, this is John Ricciuti at Mainline Public Television and Radnor Studio 21. My guest today on Faces of the Mainline is Dr. Peter Freshy. He is a cardiologist and he's affiliated with Abington Hospital and other affiliations, which you'll get into. Doctor, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time to come on. Pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Um, uh, let me just start by saying my mother was the only one required to call me Dr. Freshy. Everybody else calls me Peter. Why was your mother required to call you that? She's the one who put me up to becoming a doctor when I was 13. Did you want to become a doctor? I thought I was going to go into my father's business as a food broker, but then she got me a job uh, working as a stock boy in the emergency room at Fitzgerald Mercy Hospital. And from then, I took every position from age 13 through medical school uh, and became a doctor. I liked working in the hospital scene. Well, well that, that's really nice inspiration. Your, your mom worked at Fitzgerald Mercy? <clears throat> she uh, was director of social work there. Really? God bless you, and God bless her for inspiring you to become a physician. All her kids became socially conscious. Terrific. That's really nice. Um, I'm going to ask you first, uh, what type of uh, do you practice? I'm an invasive cardiologist. I'm in a practice with 21 cardiologists. We cover Abington Hospital, Jeans Hospital, Fox Chase Cancer Center, uh, Holy Redeemer Hospital, and Aria Torresdale. Why, what inspired you to be, and I've asked other doctors this, why a cardiologist? Well, it's the most important thing in our body, but, but seriously. <clears throat> when I, when I decided I wanted to become a doctor, I always learned, was told, that you had to be a good medicine doctor. You had to know internal medicine to become a good at anything. So I really became, through medical school, a, I specialized in internal medicine. But then, in, while I was in medical school, a third year student, I got a mentor be, uh, who was a heart surgeon. And then he sort of took on to me and I was tracked to become a heart surgeon and go to the uh, Texas Heart Institute. And I started a surgical program, but I wasn't happy within months. And I came home one day and I told my wife, uh, I'm not happy and I'm leaving the job tomorrow. By 24 hours later, I had an internal medicine residency. I did my internal medicine residency and during that I became a cardiologist and then I became a uh, an invasive cardiologist. An invasive cardiologist does general cardiology, takes care of patients from general cardiology issues, but I also uh, do cardiac catheterizations, I do technical procedures to open up arteries, I open up valves, I do state-of-the-art uh, procedures on patients. State-of-the-art? That means up-to-date. No, I, I, I know what that means. <laughs> I know what you mean by that. I know what state-of-the-art means. I do simple cardiac catheterization diagnostics. I do simple and complex coronary interventions to open up blockages. I open up chronically occluded blockages through really specialized techniques with uh, tools that are now available that weren't available 10 years ago. I work with a structural heart team uh, working uh, to do trans aortic valve replacements. Uh, on patients that are intermediate or higher risk for surgery, that patients that are in their 80s with other medical issues, that surgery would be more complicated and have higher risk. <clears throat> and in the last year, I started doing a, a procedure called the Watchman Left Atrial Appendage Closure uh, device, which treats patients uh, who are not good candidates for blood thinners for atrial fibrillation. So right there, we've covered the whole gamut of cardiology, which is full. Someone comes to you. How, how, how does someone get to you? The, I mean, they, they already know that they have an existing heart condition when they get to you. Is that right? I don't have to put a flag out on the street and wave people in. Patients, as they get older, uh, start to have symptoms. Symptoms of chest pain, shortness of breath, uh, rapid heartbeat, uh, and those generally are, uh, they get them into the system of, uh, of doctor's office, a primary care, an internal medicine doctor, 
uh, <coughs> for evaluation. And I'm in a big group of cardiologists and we have a good reputation and patients come to us. How do you go about the cleaning out someone's arteries, say? Well, our conversation is not up to that yet. Our conversation is they've come in the door with some symptoms, chest pain or shortness of breath, and I have to be a diagnostician. I have to be a detective to try to figure out so what their issues are. There are blood tests that help us, their cholesterol numbers, uh, their family history, are they a smoker, uh, what does their electrocardiogram look like, they can have an ultrasound of their heart to look at uh, the valves, to look at the squeeze of the muscle. So there's non-invasive studies that patients get. And then oftentimes, then they'll come for a heart catheterization. And through the wrist or through the leg, uh, if there's a pulse, I can usually get a catheter up into their heart to define the pressures in the heart, to define the anatomy of the heart, uh, and see, diagnose the issue. Is it a coronary artery blockage problem, a narrowing problem? Is it a valve problem? Do they have a tightly narrowed aortic valve or a mitral valve? Do they have a leaky mitral valve? Do they have a leaky aortic valve? So there are, there's a process to figure patients out and you just have to think and go through an orderly fashion to take care of them. How do you approach a, a patient? My success is treating everybody like they're my mother and father, brother and sister. And then when I, when I go that process and go through the, the medical, the, the diagnostic issues, history, physical diagnosis, uh, then it's easy to safely take care of patients and figure out what their issues are. How do I do a heart catheterization? I have a laboratory that I work with a staff of nurses and technicians with x-ray equipment just like you work with uh, cameras. I work with a team of people that uh, help me get the pictures and, and the uh, procedures completed. Where is the procedure, like where is the, the point of origin where you would go into someone's heart? <clears throat> Generally, for many, many years, we generally did cardiac catheterizations through the groin, the femoral site, where there's an, a big artery and a big vein. And a lot of times now, when patients have other issues, uh, we're able to access the arteries uh, in their wrist, the radial artery. But every patient is different, and every situation is different. So you have to tailor your procedure to the patient that you're working on, and the d diagnosis or the disease that you're trying to figure out. You said that there were common symptoms. Are there other symptoms that aren't common? Sure, and, and that's important because patients have a lot of symptoms and patients generally uh, try to downplay their symptoms. So patients may have some pressure in their chest, may have some indigestion, they may have some discomfort up into their neck or into their jaw, they could have some discomfort in their uh, arms. This may be with exertion, it may be with rest. They may have shortness of breath. They may have been able to go to the gym and walk two miles, but now they can't walk a half a mile. Uh, they can't walk out to their car because of shortness of breath or some pressure in their chest or something's not quite right. So it's incumbent upon people who, as we get older, to recognize that our diminished ability to do stuff or, f or what we're feeling may be a real medical issue. Do you, do you see from the time you became a cardiologist to the present time, has there been dramatic improvements in, in, in the, the treating of heart disease? <clears throat> That's an easy question because if, if you look at all the scales over time, heart disease has really come down significantly. The mortality from dying from a heart attack has gone from 10% to less than 1%. Uh, our ability to open up arteries quickly uh, has uh, dramatically improved. The technology that I have at my hand today is much better than 
uh, when I started in 1988. Uh, I'm, I'm getting old. I used to be the youngest guy in the practice doing this stuff. Now, I'm the oldest guy in the practice doing this stuff. Uh, the technology has changed. People don't smoke as much. Mm. So heart disease has come down significantly. The number of patients that present with massive heart attacks and shock has dramatically diminished too because people have now, we now recognize symptoms and people are getting to the hospital earlier. Is it also the result of the medications that are available that, that are preventative like Zimbralta, is that the, the word? Uh, no, but aspirin's important and people are treating their cholesterols more aggressively uh, with the statin drugs uh, and, and people are treating hypertension uh, with with drugs uh, better now. Okay. You, so I, all of these things are contributing to a, a diminution of heart disease. I want to ask you a question, uh, and and you can you know bang me on the head when I ask you this question. But there was some things written that cholesterol was a uh, uh, something that was derived by the AMA and it really isn't what it really is. But you have a different view of it because you see it firsthand. Did you ever hear that theory? <clears throat> that I'm not sure exactly what you're getting at, but I'll tell you this, that for years, cholesterol is really important. People need to have low cholesterol numbers. Okay. And the statin drugs help. Uh, and the guidelines that are out have gone down over time from a guideline that said a total cholesterol of 200, then 150, and then 100, and now we break it down. I, but there's a number on the cholesterol, the bad cholesterol number, that I've always treated my patients to try to get that number as low as possible. In my letters I say, I want the LDL cholesterol to be abysmally low, and that means under 60. And I try to get that through a combination of diet, uh, exercise, and statin therapy. Because most patients, when they come to me, I'm diagnosing blockages. And they've, they've had a heart attack, or they have blockages, or I've fixed their blockages. What do you do to get the person to reduce the cholesterol? What do you tell them? Here's what, this is what I want you to eat. I want you to go to this diet, dietician. Uh, I, I, I want, you know, I, you're I, talking to a patient. As, 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 you know what? As I'm I, I have the same uh, conversation with patients every day. The same conversation. I really want, you know, living in America is good. We have a great country and it's great and we live really well. Poor people live pretty well too and eat, and, but we eat a lot of junk. There's a lot of fast food out there. Mm -hmm. So basically, I tell patients to avoid fat. If, it, if you can look at it and say that this is healthy, this should go in my mouth, then they should eat it. But, but ice cream, cheese, pizza, fried foods. Uh, not good. Not good. If you're going to eat meat, you know, you, you can't eat a, a ribeye steak uh, or eat, eat, eat the fat on a Pieces prime rib. prime rib, you can't do that. You have to, you know. I would, I say, a six or eight ounce petite fillet. That's a pretty good piece of meat. But really, what I tell patients now: lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, lots of chicken, lots of fish. Take the skin off the chicken. Lots of baked, baked. Go into a restaurant. Don't, don't take the, don't have bread and butter. Don't take the, and, I, and I'm really because of obesity, I'm really working on patients to try to cut down the carbs, the breads, the cakes, the pasta, the potatoes, the rice. We eat too much. We need smaller portions. You really, you really give me the impression, and, and that's a good thing, because I'm talking to you like you're my doctor and I'm your patient. What do you do for like? You, do, what do you do for like excitement? Do you, you you seem like a very intense guy. Do you uh, do you I, have uh, the things I have you a, like? I, a, I do a lot of things. I really do a lot of things. I work really hard. I, I believe that. It's I work, evident. I work really hard and long hours. I'm on call a lot. 
But I, I have a lot of passions. I have a passion for dogs. I have border really? terriers. I've been showing and breeding border terriers for 25 years. Really? Mm hmm I, uh, I'm involved uh, in a lot of gardening. I love to have a beautiful property. So I'm, I'm always out landscaping. Uh, my lands I have a landscaper, but I like working the property a lot. I clean up the property, pick a lot of weeds. Do you? Pick a lot of weeds. Uh, I have some motorcycles I ride on, a, on the weekend. Uh, and I study a lot. I come home from work and I, I usually listen to medical cases that are being done from around the world. I subscribe to a medical service where I can see live cases or recorded cases commonly on different procedures. The motorcycle thing kind of like, um, that's kind of like, that is, that is living dangerously if I don't, if you don't mind me saying. It is, and it's scary. Uh, but you're not the only doctor I know that, that I know a doctor that uh, is a mountain climber, and that's scary too. Uh, and, and he surfs, so th that's th those are two scary things to do. But that's, I guess, you know, when you're in a profession, you're that way. And I'm, I'm I, not trying to dig at your philosophy, but you know. Well, I see a lot of life and death, and I understand how fragile life is. And I try to, uh, I'm trying to just make my life as full as I can and have as much fun as I can. I really appreciate the day to day. I see young people dying. How does that affect you? It hurts me because I like to be able to help people. I can't help everybody. Do you, hmm. And sometimes I even hurt people because I do a lot of procedures. I do 400 procedures a year. And not every procedure always goes well. Sometimes there are complications. Sometimes uh, there are disastrous complications. Do you carry that around with you? All the time. Think about it all the time. Not, not good. What do you do to get rid of it? Go to sleep. Yeah? Go to sleep, talk to my wife. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, do you, this is a science fiction question. Do you ever think that there'll be an effective artificial heart that can, that can take the place legitimately with any longevity of what we have as our, the heart that we're born with? I would tell you this, that heart failure is its own specialty now. When we were young, they did the first heart transplant. Right, I, I, I remember they that. They did the first heart transplant. And then years ago, they did the first, you know, artificial external heart. Now for the management of heart failure, we have left ventricular assist devices uh, and uh, which serve as bridges to transplantation or sometimes even in older people that are not transplant candidates because usually transplantation of a heart is for patients under 70 but there are a lot of patients that are you know that are 70 that are on the cusp of not doing well with heart failure and there are left ventricular assist devices that are really getting small the size of a fist or even smaller uh, that are external and that are really doing patients well now. It's a it's its own specialty that's gone beyond me. It's gone beyond you. Yes. Wow. You, 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 you want to be you want to you don't want to be a jack of all trades, master of none. I have a good number of procedures I do: cardiac catheterizations, co simple and complex coronary interventions, the TAVR, the Watchman. That, that's a full plate. Plus, I have to see patients in the hospital with my nurse practitioners, and so there's only so much you can do. And and so there's there's guys that are being trained now, and there's younger doctors than me that are really specializing in just heart failure. I want to talk. Uh, the reason I ask you these questions is because I want you to talk to me like I'm I'm a patient, and I'm I'm, I'm getting that sense from you. What, what, is, what is a complex catheterization? Well, patients can have a simple blockage, uh, whatever, 50 to 99% blockage. It's a discrete blockage. But sometimes people have blockages in multiple vessels at the branch points in vessels. Sometimes there are occluded vessels that, pay, that, that are difficult to open up. 
and they require a lot of time and technique, different techniques. Uh, most of the times we go down the vessel and get through the blockage with a wire, but sometimes we go the circuitous route. We go from the other vessel through the helper vessel and then come up and try to get through the blockage that way. So that's called a chronic total occlusion or retrograde technique. They're very, it's very specialized. I know some of my friends that have uh, heart valves that came from either a pig. How is that, how does that work? I know the animal tissue adheres to the heart tissue. You replace a valve. You've done that? Those heart valves? I don't do heart surgery. Okay. Replacement of valves, either uh, pig valves, bioprosthetic valves, or mechanical metal valves uh, is done by a surgeon. What I do do now is the aortic valve is able to be replaced percutaneously. And I am on a team and commonly each week replace the aortic valve percutaneously. There's a, I'm sure there'll be a, a visual of this, but the, 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 the valve is compressed onto a balloon. We position it carefully and we inflate it and voila, a new valve is in place. Just like that. Just like that. Oh, well, for me. It's I've, been, I've been working on, I, 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 well, went, I, mean, I went to Cooper Hospital, which is a very good center, and work with uh, some friends and, and colleagues uh, for a whole year, just observing and being a part of their team, never touching a catheter or a valve. And then we brought that technology up to Abington in 2014. And we have, we have a very successful program doing really well. What do you uh, what do you recommend to your patients after you've had all their procedures? If you've done a procedure to go about living your life as normal, uh, I know you've well, talked about uh, diet. And they'll, you they'll, about they'll leave the hospital for whatever their problem is. If their problem is coronary artery disease, and I put a stent, or they had a heart attack, and I put a stent or even if they were managed medically for their blockages or their disease or their chest pain or hypertension. They have to take their medicines. They have to be compliant. They have to follow up with their doctors. And then they have to be active. They have to figure out an exercise program. They have to, or a walking program. Something to, to utilize their body and get their weight down and get their bones and joints in better condition. And they have to eat right. And like we said earlier, yeah. It's, all, it's all of it. And then if they have atrial fibrillation, that's another problem. You know, with they, they have a risk of stroke patients that have irregular heartbeats and fibrillation. They need to be on blood thinners generally. So they need careful follow-up and they need to know about you know, recognizing any bleeding possibilities. Or So... People that are AFib, that you... Yeah. Patients with atrial fibrillation. And, 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 and you treat those patients as well? Mm-hmm. Is, are there levels of, of, of uh, AFib? Or is it, if, if it no. is, it is. It's just if no, you got it, you no, got no, it, no, and that's no. it. No, there are patients that have it rarely. There are patients that may have short episodes. There are patients that have longer episodes that come and go. And then there is persistent or chronic atrial fibrillation where, it's, where it stays all the time. I've done some very little reading about this, but because I have a, his, a family history of, of heart disease. Is there, is there a th uh, treatment where you can shock the person's heart back into a normal, d do, you, do you advise that? Everyone's different, but yes, we, we cardiovert patients from a atrial fibrillation rhythm back to a sinus rhythm, not uncommonly. Being in a normal rhythm is better than being in atrial fibrillation. Now, let's get to you. If you have a family history of heart disease, are you doing the right things? Um, Do you have good control of your blood pressure? Do you have an abysmally low cholesterol number? Have you had a stress test? Have you seen your doctor? Have you been doing what you need to do? About 90% of those things. I've okay. been doing I've been doing 90% of them. Okay. But I'm working on the I'm, I'm working on the uh, on one of them. Good. Yes, keep I am. Keep working. It's I'm, important. Oh, I, because living a long time and enjoying this planet and enjoying the United States of America is a good thing. And you can't do it if you're dead. I don't know. You're right. 
You can't do it if you're dead. You have to take care of yourself. How long would you like to practice medicine? Last question. I just turned 60. Oh, then you have 20 more years to do this. So, I, I think about retirement a lot. Do you really? I think about retirement a lot, but it's not coming anytime soon. What would you do if you retired? Live more dangerously? I would, there's a lot I would do. I'd probably go into a car detailing business. Would you really? I'd, I'd try to get one client a day and detail one car a day. You'd like to do that? I like I what like cleaning. You do is detailing I, like, now. I, I like detailing and taking care yeah. of things. I like taking care of things. Yeah, you've been a you've been terrific. I, I and I thank you for being patient with me and not patient, patient, patient with me in my questions. My because, pleasure to be here. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, there's a lot of things I didn't know, and and uh, I really appreciate you taking the there's, time. There's to a lot of cardiology, and there are a lot of patients, and they need to take patients need to take care of themselves. It's really important. Because you can't have fun if you're dead. Nope. Very hard. Thank you. Pleasure. God bless you. I Thank wish you lots of luck. Thank you. And anybody in your hands is in good hands. I work really hard to take care of people. Yes, I can tell that. I, I, I got a sense of it's that. It's really important. It's really important to take care of patients and get good results. So I'm not going to call you doctor. With uh, Peter Freshy, a face of the main line, this is John Ricciuti, Mainline Public Television and Radnor Studio 21. Take care of yourself.